A very good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. It's great to see you all coming in such numbers. If you can hear me and see us on your screens, uh, please quickly respond with a yes in the chat box so that we know that you're here and you know that you are listening to us. Uh, if you can hear me and, and you can see us on your screens, uh, please respond with a yes in the chat box. Thank you, Harsha. Thank you, Raghav. Perfect. So it's lots and lots of yeses coming in. Uh, I'm so glad that all of you decided to be here spending the evening with us and, and our extreme guests. And today we're going to discuss a very, very important topic. Um, just to be insured, just to be just to be safe, let's, let's just uh, put a, a few ground rules here. Uh, like every other technological platform, this is also a platform which runs a technology and sometimes technology isn't our best friend. So in case there is a little bit of an audio or a video lag, please don't fret. There's a red button called reconnect on the top of your, up, on the top of your screens. In case there's an audio lag or a video lag or you can't see us or you can't hear us, just click on reconnect and we'll be right back for you. That's one. Uh, second thing is please, please, please use the chat box very judiciously. Uh, the two cases under which chat box option is to be used is number one, to be able to ask questions uh, from the guests and from the panelists. And second thing is if we ask a question and you want to make a response to it, that's when you use the chat box option. Uh, without any further ado, let me introduce today's topic followed by our extreme panelists. Uh, now, the, the fact that COVID-19 has literally turned the world upside down is no myth. It's, it's, it's a fact that's omnipresent, it's a fact that, that everyone knows about. What we actually need to understand is that education is one of the one of the most important sectors that has been hit by this pandemic. What we also need to at the same time understand is that as universities, as colleges, as schools, as organizations strive to function the new normal and understand processes, understand eligibilities, understand and work their way through all of this ambiguity, there are going to be a lot of changes. One of the most recent and the most drastic changes have been those around standardized tests. So SAT or ACT or other standardized examinations such as LNAT, HAT, etc. They're being postponed or they're being conducted online. They're being conducted in a proctored manner uh, because universities understand that not everyone has the access or the flexibility to go into a center and actually do the test there. So new and more innovative ways of navigating about the testing centers or carry out the tests are being experimented with. At the same time, a lot of confusion arises. Okay, if I want to apply to the US for my undergrad admissions, do I need to take the SAT? Do I need to take the ACT? Between the two, which one should I prioritize? And, and more importantly, are universities going to value whatever I'm giving them? Now, certain universities, for example, have made a clear notification that we don't need your SAT scores for this year or for a couple of years uh, to come from now. But does that mean that the university that's on my radar, that's on my target, does it not need the, my, my standardized test scores or my SAT or ACT scores as well? What's going to happen to IELTS Academic? What's going to happen to TOEFL? What's going to happen to GMAT, GRE? All of those are questions that are surrounding minds of all the kids that we are, are meeting in today in the current times. So that, that's going to be something which we're going to discuss today, which is how much is the navigation of, of ACTs and ACTs and other standardized examinations impacted by the COVID? We are going to understand what all trends are being are, are, are being deterred, are being discovered at the new newest course. Um, we're also going to demystify the SAT and the ACT and understand the subtle nuances between the tests, and that will hopefully be able to help you choose and, and kind of select which one is more your style of examination. And those are some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. I have with me two of our very extreme, uh, two of our very esteemed guests. Um, the first guest I'd like to introduce is Dr. Andreas Stradis. Um, Andreas is a full-time professional private tutor with a range of overseas postings under his belt, including France, Italy, Monaco, and Switzerland. He currently teaches and resides in Zurich, a former academic with degrees in English from Magdalen College, Oxford, international relations from LSE, and a PhD from the University of Bristol. He continues to be active as a senior research fellow for the Atlantic Council of the United Kingdom, the NATO Public and Youth Engagement Organization. An experienced university admissions counselor, Andreas has been a member of the College of I Europe team since its inception, assisting with the development of the platform through his insights as a professional educator. He has successfully sent many students across the Atlantic thanks to his integration of College of I's insights into his teaching methods and continues to advocate for the evolution of education 
through intelligently applied technology. Uh, welcome, Andreas, and we're looking forward to learn a lot from you and gain value from your insights. Uh, the second thank, guest thank on you the very panel, much. The second guest on the panel is Mr. Arkav Das, head faculty verbal for College of Higher India. Uh, a maverick with deep interest in phenomenology and poetry from the Kitodian. Uh, Arkav did his master's in literature from Jawaharlal uh, University, Delhi focusing on the inter intersection between thinkers such as Hegel, Heidegger, and Lakin, and poetry in the subcontinent and beyond. He has been prepping students for the verbal sections of the ACT, ACT, GMAT, and GRE since 2010. So a lot of experience there. Welcome, Arkav. We look forward to learning from your experience as well. And we are sure that all the students have come online today, they're going to be extremely benefited uh, by the insights that you guys are going to share. I know that verbal spe section specifically and, and the SAT and ACT on the whole is, is a challenge and a pain point for a lot of Indian students. So look forward to, to, to your discussions, your learnings, your pointers and tips on how we can navigate that entire experience. Over to you guys. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so without wanting to reiterate too much, um, I think the main purpose of today, as, as has been said, is to give you all an overall picture of what standardized testing actually is, um, with some 4 million papers being taken last academic year alone, and why it's crucial um, to incorporate uh, these tests into your, your preparation seriously in order to achieve your university ambitions. I'll then discuss how standardized testing fits into the most recent admissions picture, um, so that's going to be the 2020 admissions picture. And um, I'll outline the different components to an application um, that universities actually assess. It's then useful to have, as has been said, a brief summary of the main differences between the SAT and the ACT. Um, and um, how best to come to the right decision. And there are actually some, some nuances there that, that are worth unpicking and indeed some tests that can be taken in order for you all to make a, uh, not just a decision based on guesswork, but actually a decision based, based on some robust metrics uh, that the Collegify platform can provide. Uh, we'll then take a look at the Collegify portal itself um, and its utility for tackling the SAT and the ACT tests. Our cover will then discuss how digitally, dig, digitally enhanced learning, excuse me, is transforming the classroom for the better. Um, and then finally, we'll look beyond 2020, of course, this being uh, an exceptional time for the education industry and for students such as yourselves. And we'll look at the continued relevance or likely continued relevance of these standardized tests um, and their utility in preparing you, not just for university admission, of course, but for future employment and indeed for, for further education as well. So having said all that, what is standardized testing and why should you care about it? Um, since its inception, right through to the present day, this has been part of U.S. University's DNA. Its origins stem from a former president of Harvard University, actually, um, a man called Charles William Elliott, who proposed a single round of common entrance testing for all universities in the late 19th century. Um, by the 1900s, these, these tests became crucial in modern higher education and employment. Uh, when in 1905, a French psychologist called Alfred Binet developed a standardized test for intelligence, which is the precursor to the well-known IQ test that we've all encountered or at least heard of today. Uh, this was called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test, and it continues to find its expression in various forms in modern society, from the psychometric tests that you might do as part of your entrance to, for example, law firms or government or indeed um, the SAT or ACT. So uh, it wasn't long before the US National Education Association endorsed these standardized tests around the start of World War I. And the first SAT test was administered in 1926 by the College Board, which still performs the same role today for those of you who have logged into the website. The key point here is that throughout their history, these tests have been technologically led. And they were transformed from 1935 onwards when a high speed when high speed computing was applied to the SAT using um, the now antiquated but then cutting edge IBM 805 computer as a test scanner from 1936. So always driven by technology. The test has remained largely unchanged from that point to 2005. 
Um, and that entire period of history, students were simply scribbling onto a piece of paper. These papers were then run through uh, computers um, as multiple choice answer sheets. And all that's really happened is that we've just had essentially more modern versions of the old IBM 805 processing these answer sheets. So with COVID-19 having transformed the working environment for students and employers alike, it's safe to say that we're experiencing yet another technologically led change in the world of standardized testing, but not one that's unfamiliar to these organizations that run these standardized tests. As I said earlier, there were over 4 million sittings of these tests for the class of 2019. And that breaks down to around 2.2 million people or, or tests being sat for the SAT and 1.8 million for the ACT. What people often fail to appreciate is that with so many applicants, the standardized tests are often used as the sifting tool for universities. So they represent the first hurdle that applicants and often very gifted applicants um, need to clear before the rest of the application is even considered. So you could be a sports superstar, um, you could already have various advanced qualifications um, that take you up to university standard, but especially with the bottleneck that's likely to occur now in the post-COVID environment, with many students having missed out on applications this year, it really is of paramount importance that you give the standardized tests that you're going to take um, the centrality in your preparation that it deserves in order for you to make sure that you have every success of getting a place at university. So now we move on to the 2020 admissions picture, which is an unusual one to say the least. Some very gifted applicants, as I've said, can often fail to get into universities, um, especially universities appropriate to their level of academic performance um, in other spheres. This is because in the US in particular, a great deal and sometimes years of practice are put into the SAT or ACT test preparation. No matter how stellar your grades are or the literary flair of your application essays, they're likely to remain unread unless the standardized test score pulls your application to the top of the sifting pile, or at least gets you under the eyes and scrutiny of a human, um, of a human processor. Um, also, the parts in blue that you can see here, the grades representing 60% of the acceptance criteria and the essays um, and extracurricular activities are around 20%. These are very much the fixed parts of your application. Um, they're almost impossible to improve upon once you are already into the phase of university applications, unless you're doing resets and you can devote the time to those resets, or indeed if you're willing to consider, um, you know, retakes in the following year and you take a gap year, but that's, that's generally seen as quite unusual, unless it's part of the plan. The SAT and ACT, however, are the movable and improvable parts of your application um, as the year goes on. And there are multiple sittings each year as well. There are also the tests in which practice and strategy, rather than raw intelligence or raw knowledge, are crucial. And improvements of over 300 points are not unheard of. Indeed, um, the last student I taught here in Zurich uh, went from a score just over um, 1,000 to around 1350 and was able to significantly um, increase the band of university options that he was able to consider as a result of that. Um, what does this mean in real terms, this 300 point improvement? Well, it's the difference between Florida State University, which requires around a 1250 SAT score out of a total of 1600, and a Harvard, a Princeton, or a Yale which require a score of around 1550. To look at it one way, the catch is that without a strong standardized test score, even the best students will fall by the wayside, especially towards the application deadline when organizations such as um, these universities are under increasing pressure. And that goes for employers as well, of course, um, who might be using psychometric tests of a similar ilk. Looked at from a different angle, Almost every student in the world will have an aspect of their application that they would like to have improved. None of us get things right 100% the first time. Simply put, 
focusing on the SAT or the ACT is the most time efficient and impactful way of improving your application, short of going through the rigmarole of resets, skipping years, and so on. And it can continue to be improved. Um, the good news is it can continue to be improved long after your predicted grades for your IB or A levels have been released, or even after your exam results have come out. Um, and just to drive this point home, there is likely to be a bottleneck um, in the coming years as the numbers of students who've perhaps um, decided to defer their applications due to the COVID-19 situation then rejoin the applicant pool. So this actually does weight the importance of the SAT and ACT even more so than in previous years. Moving on then to the differences between the SAT and ACT. Um, don't concern yourselves too much with all the detail in the table just yet. I will just outline um, some of the main differences first, and then I'll get into some of the detail in the table. Which test to take and why does it matter? This crucial choice is often underestimated by both parents and applicants. Um, there are significant implications for scoring, which I won't go into fully here, but I'll cover the most important differences, which you can begin by seeing in the table. Both tests comprise three common components. So you'll see that the reading, writing and maths sections are common to both. Uh, and the maths breaks down further actually into calculator and non-calculator. Um, there is a specific science only section for the ACT. However, it's a common misconception that the SAT has no science in it because there are always science based extracts or um, reading extracts in the SAT itself. So don't be fooled by thinking that the SAT is the non scientist paper and the ACT is the scientist paper. It's not quite correct. Overall, um, I think the thing to pay attention to is the fact that the SAT is a more detail oriented and in depth test. And you'll see that this is reflected in the longer average question times or response times per question. And the questions tend to be more complex. The passages tend to be longer and they suit those with a flair for um, the humanities. So those that enjoy uh, English literature, for example, or history um, and really like sinking their teeth into complex reading. The ACT, by contrast, is a much faster paced exam. So question times here average around 50 seconds rather than the 75 seconds on the SAT. And the ACT also tends to have texts that don't have as much archaic or obscure language. You're, you're unlikely to get a text from the 19th century in the ACT, uh, whereas the SAT will actually have quite a few. Um, so it's fair to say that those who prefer the sciences to the humanities should sit this test. But as, as I said, don't, if, don't think that you're escaping uh, scientific reading or scientific topics by taking the SAT. That's, that's a common misconception. However, what I would say is that this decision shouldn't be left to guesswork or just a hunch based on what I've said. I'd highly recommend that students and parents um, harness the powerful performance analytics that we offer through the Collegify platform to inform their decision. Um, there is a diagnostic test available um, through the Collegify platform. You don't have to sign up for anything else. Um, and this will give you a detailed bit of objective advice, uh, drawing on uh, question types from both tests um, to give you a, a very, very uh, accurate picture of which of the two tests you're better suited to. And it does this through our industry leading AI and machine learning algorithms which are based on the test data of thousands of students answering thousands of questions. Um, and it, this really is an important, uh, an, an important ally for you in, in this very important decision that can actually mean the difference between getting into your top choice university uh, and then versus having to scrabble around through your second, third, fourth choices and, and below. So, the platform itself represents really a new era of online testing. As I said, um, the standardized tests have always been uh, oriented around uh, computing processing power. 
So beyond the choice of which test to take, um, the question is where does the Collegify platform come into all of this? Um, Arcava and I will give you a canter through some of the main features of the platform. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the tests, um, I'll give you some crucial context. Um, even before online testing, it's important to notice that these tests are so much more complex than the four categories I mentioned, the reading, writing, maths, and science. Preparing well and being able to navigate the test are just as, if not more important, than the actual knowledge that you hold. Um, having a realistic environment, i.e., especially as we shift online, is also crucial because the test is long and arduous and there's no time for unfamiliarity. As I discovered when I first took the test, I just sort of thought, well, I'm getting straight A's in all my subjects, how hard could it be? I turned up on the day and was completely baffled by the format uh, and, and sort of the question types and the style of, of the questions. It's also likely that post COVID-19, we're gonna see these tests remain online, at the very least as an online option, even if uh, physical test centers do reopen. And with so many demands on students as well, it's important that your preparation is time efficient. And Arkave and I will come on to that when we give a demonstration of the platform itself. In terms of AI and machine learning, um, as we look at the platform, I'm gonna show you how Collegify's performance analytics let you zoom in on your weaknesses rapidly and can give you a topic specific structure for you to follow. So really taking all the administration of your preparation away and allowing you to actually focus on skill development. Um, I'll also talk about how it helps you helps guide you through the college admissions process with useful tools like the predicted score. So you can really have a, a clear and accurate understanding of where you're most likely to land um, on your wish list of universities. Um, I'll now hand over to Arkaba, who's just going to outline what he's going to talk about with respect to college applications and the digital classroom. Thank you, Andres. I believe uh, what will how we'll go about it is first of all I'll give my opinion on some of the stuff that you have already uh, put forward. Um, so on the slide, all of you can see that uh, we have this classes or portal, this binary, this difference. So is it that I have to choose the classes over portal, or I'll go for a portal and not opt for classes, right? So I'm going here to tell you that classes are important. So technology, as Andreas very clearly and cogently told you, technology is the backbone of these tests, right? So in India, when we, when I teach a lot of students who are coming from, let's say, a CBSE background, now the first thing that my students tell me is that the verb portion is really challenging, right? So uh, and I think Andreas mentioned it, uh, seeing a passage written by a 19th century author is a shock to the system of any, let's say, a CBSE student who is uh, used to a sort of um, uh, literature and language and syntax, which is not as challenging as the stuff on the ACT. So when it comes to the classes or the portal, uh, you know, this sort of binary, I would always say that at least speaking from an Indian perspective, classes are very important. But classes are not a fail-safe solution. And uh, this is from my years of teaching that I've understood. Uh, in classes, you can deliver material very well. That means you can adapt to the specific needs of your students, right? So those of you who are students here, you can really understand that when you speak with your teacher and your teacher addresses your questions or answers your questions even before you actually voice them, it's definitely uh, helpful, right? So there is no, uh, you know, sort of replacing a teacher in the classroom. So that is not going to happen, obviously. But during the classes, any take any class where you're preparing for a specific test, uh, this is the scenario. There are around 12 odd people in the uh, class, or maybe more than that. Uh, your your lecture happens, the specific lecture happens, you're given assigned homework, you do your homework, you come back later in the week, and you get all your doubts resolved. Now, what is what gets lost in the process? And that's the second point, which is what classes miss out on, is what about the questions that you got right? 
what about the questions that you had to really think hard about and finally you got the answer but you are not very sure about so there is always this hesitation that you will feel that should i even bring it up to the teacher and frankly for a teacher in a class of 12 or 15 students it's just not possible to go through every uh, question that you have solved understand how much time you have taken for that specific question whether your understanding on that question reflects uh, the need uh, the needed you know sort of expertise for the sat i mean that is absolutely uh, not going to happen right in a class so maybe over the course of a few weeks your teacher will get to know you better will understand okay these are your broad weaknesses these are your broad improvement areas these are the broad concepts that you need to work on but specific feedback on your homework specific feedback on your learning will not happen from day one so there comes the need of some technology right so it can be a portal some technology is essential over there because you get real time feedback so it's not as if you'll have to depend on your teacher for every question that you are solving through or uh, you have to depend on certain review sessions to happen before you understand okay so this was my improvement area so i was feeling as if modifiers was something that i understood because i already know that from school but once i came to act modifiers i quickly figure out that maybe i don't my concepts are not clear enough even after attending the lecture even after correctly solving through all the practice material so that sort of granularity is very important and that can only happen when any sort of technology is recording your every move right so the portal is very important from that perspective that uh, it it really tracks you uh, it, it's sort of this helping hand which is always with you not just telling you what is the correct answer or whether you finish the answer within time because the portal is entirely time bound as well now this is very important when you do your homework more often than not what happens is with my students at least you tend to overshoot the time limit so even if i tell you in class that uh, guys you are going to just do five passages and in 65 minutes uh, you will end up spending more time on it or less time on it depending on your expertise or depending on your patience levels now on a portal or on a, any technological uh, you know system what will happen is your hands will be tied you you have to abide by what the system tells you to do so that sort of structure is really helpful especially when you're self learning when you're meeting your tutor at um, regular intervals but in between the practice that you're doing is time bound so you have other commitments and you want to focus your prep very well so over there definitely i agree that the portal or a technological solution is very important however the portal misses out on certain things as well and i already have spoken about it so i'm not going to again go on talking about okay what portal misses out on etc cetera, etc cetera. that means um you know there are certain human aspects to learning so we have videos on the portal we have uh, text lessons on the portal but does that really substitute for a teacher uh, who is actively in real time speaking to you understanding you understanding your gestures as well um of course not right so i think integrating the classes and the portal so rather than that question classes or portal i would definitely say that everyone should look at classes and portal so these classes need not always be extensive regular classes if your schedule doesn't allow it but definitely you should look at attending regular webinars or classes now live classes and portal comes from this uh, you know philosophy that we have that we do need that human interaction we do need to understand problems uh, not just from human to algorithm and algorithm back to human though that is very important because sat itself is you know it it's entirely technical it's entirely mechanical uh, so uh, your your you know the answers that you record on your test they are not checked by humans right it's not like one human grader is there and checking each and ans each answer that you've um, you know recorded that's not happening so obviously uh, you know there is technology but when it comes to live classes you get to air all your doubts so all the accumulated doubts that you might have from solving on the portal from doing practice from i even identifying the areas where you're taking time to solve a particular species of questions so all of that gets taken care of with live classes so what happens with uh, live classes is the classes are mapped to the portal that means let's say uh, you're covering modifiers 
parallelism and comparisons in one class, uh, in one life class, what you can do is you attend the life class because you feel that this is one improvement area that you have. Okay, these are three improvement areas that you have. You attend the class, you come back, and then you attempt the worksheets related to those topics. That means the live classes is anyway mapped to the portal. So you attend the live class, you get your concepts cleared with an actual real-time faculty, and then you come back and start working on the portal again. And the portal will obviously have a support system, an ecosystem in terms of videos, in terms of learning tools, in terms of worksheets. And graded worksheets, timed worksheets, very important for your uh, performance. Um, now, the last thing over here that we have on the slide is, of course, last two things. One is learn to take charge of your prep. Now, this is something that I don't want to expand too much on, because in this situation where all of you have been surviving through and thriving in isolation, right? you have already understood the value of discipline, the value of perseverance, and the value of ensuring that you are taking care of yourself. So it's not as if someone else is guiding your every move, not at all. With the live classes, with the portal, what happens is you get this degree of autonomy. That means uh, you are not in the dark. You're not wondering, OK, I don't understand history passages related to founding documents. What should I do? You have your answers with you because you have data with you, first of all, from the portal, which tells you how exactly you can address this, which worksheets to do, et cetera, et cetera. So all that gets taken care of. And of course, your teacher will guide you in terms of what specific additional stuff you can do for your uh, improvement. So that brings us to the last point, which is share your progress with your teachers through the predicted score, right? So predicted score over here. And I think uh, I'll just share my screen now, Andreas. Yeah, sure thing I'll cover. Right, so the predicted score is something that I'll, I'd really like to show you. <clears throat> OK, I'm not sure whether this is visible. <clears throat> it is at my end, I'll cover. So uh, I right. think Wonderful. we can proceed. So, yep. Yeah. So here, when it comes to predicted score, let's take a look at, first of all, this is the platform. This is how it will look. So you can see on top, you have modifiers over here, because modifiers is what uh, you have been solving last, right? So you have resumed lesson, et cetera. Uh, to the right, you can see December 5, 120 days till the exam. Now, this is very important. And I think Andreas will be speaking more at length on why this is important and how it allows you to really plan your applications as well, aside from just your test, right? I mean, I think um, that we'll speak about. But let's go over to the other details of the portal. Now, when you're speaking to your teacher, when you're trying to talk about or express even concern that, uh, sir or ma'am, I'm not really confident about my abilities in this specific section. You need to be very specific sometimes yourself, right? So you cannot just tell your teacher that, OK, I'm not feeling very confident. But you cannot tell your teacher, what is it exactly that you're not confident about? Here, with uh, data, it becomes easier for you to communicate. So you can see if this is a typical student's uh, dashboard. So the first thing that you look at is your overall progress. Now, the progress for this student, ACT, it says, is 28% completed. And the percentage is, of course, calculated on the basis of the number of worksheets, the number of mocks the student has taken, the number of lesson videos the student has gone through, et cetera, et cetera. Now, section-wise progress is already there for the student to see, for you to see. So reading test, 55%, very good. Writing and language test, why is it very good? Because still there are 120 days till the exam. And already, it seems, reading test is 55% done. Writing and language is 30%. Math is not going that well. And of course, the essay has not still happened. Now, if you look at what the recent results are, uh, you can see all the practice sets, etc. Right. So this is like a snapshot that greets you as soon as you log on to the portal. Now, when it comes to the specific 
course, you will have section lists, topic lists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which Andreas will possibly talk about in more detail. But right now, I want you to look at uh, insights and the ACT predictive score, which is the first thing that we anyway started out talking about. So ACT insights brings together your performance, not just in one test. OK, so it's not like the teacher has to go through only one test and give you feedback here. Your feedback is on the basis of all the work that you have been doing in the portal for a for a while. So let's say primary purpose. If I click on it, what happens now? Primary purpose, you can see all the data points mapped over here as well as something which says average two. So I'll just click on this. What does it mean? It says you're at average level two. That means performance range 30 per 30% to 40%. So there are several levels over here, average two, and of course, later advanced levels as well, uh, which will be which we you will achieve on the basis of your performance. Now, what sort of performance? Let's quickly take a look at this graph. Here, the data points, okay. So the data points are all there for you to see. So as you can see, this student has taken an ACT diagnostic test, basic one first, and their primary purpose has not gone well. But where did primary purpose really pick up? Here, ACT mock test one. By this time, the student had gotten average one level, OK? Then it dropped down a little bit after going through practice set three, average one. Now, I want you to notice that here we had a mock test. Here we have a worksheet. Now, it doesn't seem very fair that after going through an entire mock test, the poor guy or girl has actually you know, somehow improved his or her primary purpose expertise. And suddenly, after just one worksheet, it drops. But this drop is not something there to demotivate the student. It's just to show that, OK, after solving this worksheet and the sort of uh, accuracy that you have shown and the timing that you have taken for each question, depending on its difficulty level, your primary purpose uh, data point for perhaps your um, expertise is not that much. So we'll have to revise it. So at every point, you'll find that your um, expertise is fluctuating. Now, why is it fluctuating? Because it's not a straight curve for any of us, right? So it's not learning doesn't happen in a complete ascending curve. If it happens, that's great. But not always does it happen. So you can see that allegory almost played out on this graph. So first an ascension, then again a plateau and then it goes on etc now i'll just quickly come to act predictive score here we go so act predicted score after all this work that the student has put in has it really budged um it doesn't look that way now this is a this is definitely a red flag because what has happened is even after doing this amount of work even after getting all these uh, you know different levels and different levels of expertise at the end of the day what has happened is uh, it's still a flat 1200 almost right so is it because of verbal is it because of something else we'll obviously have to check that now each of these will also be uh, displayed across topic areas. So that will help the student identify why exactly is it that I have stayed at 1200. And if the student cannot identify, what is the next step? Speak to the teacher and get it sorted out. Because this sort of graph is exactly what you don't want to have. Because you begin your ACT prep at 1200, and let's say you reach a 1300, 1350, et cetera. But even that is not good enough. And your ACT's predicted score, you can see over here, it says the score indicates your performance, of course, but 1160 to 1260. Now, that is a 100 point difference over there. And that is very necessary because uh, that, that, you know, that, that uh, difference might show up, obviously, on the final test. But on the basis of your performance after so much work, if you have just gone on a journey from 1200 to 1260, that's not a very good journey, right? So you need to stop and change and improve that journey before it gets to this point. So you will have to continuously keep an eye on the insights page and the SAT predictive score in order to build that sort of understanding of where mm. you are. Okay, if I may just um, jump in. I mean, I think guys, sure. obviously, it 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 probably goes without saying that you know for data protection reasons we we can't show you the active account of a student of ours so this mm -hmm. is our test account and you know this flat line that you're seeing here is obviously 
something that in real life um, won't survive contact. It, it it will go up and down, and you'll yeah. you know you'll have your various natural fl fluctuations over the course of the year. The same with any of the worksheets that you take, and you're certainly not going to have any teacher worth his or her salt leaving <laughs> it for you know two months before they identify any problems. The point is that this. This portal functions like a GPS watch or a cycling computer for a professional athlete. You guys are the equivalent of intellectual athletes, and you couldn't imagine uh, a professional runner or cyclist without operating without one of these devices to feed back to the coach. And the coach in this case is analogous to, to the teacher. What's made us set all these world records in athletic performance today is not because there's been some huge evolution in human genetics. It's just that we're getting smarter with our training. And the same goes for our intellectual training as well. There's no need to burn the candle at both ends, as it were, and go through lots of laborious repetition of, of tests and exercises. These days, we do have technology and we can learn smarter in the same way as athletes are able to train smarter through the use of tracking um, all of their workouts and all of their performance. And, and the same really goes for Collegify and your preparation for a test such as this. So I'll cover perhaps if you, um, could you click back onto the dashboard screen so I can just Absolutely. give an illustration yeah. of this. Right. So the main thing that you'll notice that Arkava pointed out is um, on the top right of the screen, you have your days until exam and a clear window showing you um, when your next test date is. You've also got your current lesson in the center and you've got your progress through the various overarching categories. Um, if you just scroll down slightly, I'll cover. Yeah. Um, the reading test, the writing test, the math test, math test with calculators. So you can see in broad overview where you are. Uh, this could be the equivalent of an exercise tracker telling you, you know, how much cardio you've done, uh, how many steps you've taken, and so on and so forth. So kind of make this analogous to whatever it is that you might do in daily life that, that you're trying to improve on. And this is really the, this is the SAT and ACT tracking equivalent. And it allows you to get really granular and really detailed um, with your progress and performance. So as not to kind of kid yourself about, um, you know, how, how many hours you're putting in. Because I think this is a common, a common failing of many students, myself included, when I was first studying. And certainly as when I was a teenager, um, before I learned to be realistic with myself about my performance, I would often just focus on the sheer amount of hours I was putting in. Um, and the same went for any sports training I was doing. You focus on the hours you put in and then you get sorely disappointed when that doesn't translate into actual scores. Um, if we click over onto the course page on the left, you'll see that under these overarching topic areas, uh, so under the section lists, you'll see the main topic areas. And then for each topic area, like writing and language or reading, if we click into one of those, you'll see the subtopic areas as well. Um, so again, you might have an idea because of your A-level preparation, or your IB preparation, or whatever, whatever school system you're in, you might have an idea of yourself as being an English superstar or a math superstar, whatever it might be. But what Collegify really does very neatly is pick out for you as students, if you are working on your own or for your teachers and for yourselves, if you're working with a tutor or within a classroom to prepare for the SAT, it picks out these easy to miss weaknesses on very specific subtopic areas. And it means that if you only have three hours to spare for the SAT, you're not wasting time taking a diagnostic test every time you, you step into SAT mode or ACT mode. You're honing straight in on the weakness. And this has been shown um, through every student who's gone through the platform to have um, you know, exceptionally uh, or exceptionally valuable um, repercussions for how this translates into score improvement. A really good example of this is the report section. Um, so if we click through onto a worksheet or perhaps a weekly quiz report, Uh, we can not only see, um, obviously, the scores we've got for various different practice sets, but if we actually click through into the report for a specific practice set, there's certain 
powerful tools that Collegify is able to show you. First of all, you're able to share your results um, across various different forms of media. Um, you're obviously able to see how many answers you get, correct and incorrect at a glance, but the real magic happens with the granularity as we drill down further. Um, and these questions can be sifted by difficulty level, they can be sifted by topic type, um, and also uniquely for the Collegify platform, you're able to get a good sense of how much time you've taken per question versus your average. This is a time intensive test and timing is almost everything, including the ability to recognize when it's worth skipping. So the question that Archive is hovering over now is what I call a false positive. And it's something that's impossible for teachers to identify or indeed for students once you have your answer sheet with you or once you just simply have submitted some homework unless you're tracking it through a platform like Collegify. Now this question, even though it's answered right, um, it actually costs you two right answers um, that it, in another sense in that because you've spent twice as long trying to get this right answer, you actually could have better invested that time in other questions later on in the test that you might have skipped through or just decided that um, you know, you're going to rush and have a guess at. Now, when you see this kind of graph for a full diagnostic test, you'll see that there are usually quite a few false positives. And the elimination of the false positive is um, absolutely crucial to squeezing out every last drop uh, of this particular uh, of this particular kind of test. Um, if we go further down, you'll see performance by question difficulty. Now, this was an easy practice test. However, another very important aspect of the platform is allowing you to identify how many careless errors you're making. Um, usually what happens is students tend to get a lot of hard or a disproportionate amount of hard and medium question types correct because they spot it's a difficult question, they slow down, and they actually spend the time checking their answers. And then they get to the easy questions or the very easy questions, they rattle through and they get over half of them wrong. So calibrating yourself under test conditions is something that the Collegify platform is uniquely placed to do. So you can actually understand where you're making most errors, including errors of timing. Um, our cover is now clicking through to a full diagnostic test report and hopefully we'll be able to see actually on time taken per question. Oh, sorry, by section level, if, if we go up to the section level, I want right. to just show you the granularity here. So here we can actually see that. Okay. So I think uh, this one is has not been taken. So I'll try finding another one, which is a slightly yeah, more detailed sure. report, perhaps. Yes. Perhaps for a weekly quiz, Arkava, which yeah, brings me on to the weekly quiz in any case. Yeah. So even if you as students don't want to take a full diagnostic test, you're able to put yourself in a realistic test environment once a week with the weekly quiz anyway. It is time sensitive. It is measured against your peers. And it does give you a realistic snapshot of where you are with respect to your likely performance in the final exam. Now here you can see um, exactly which overall section all your right and wrong answers fall into. And for a full diagnostic test, this is obviously very useful because it gives your teachers and yourselves uh, an overall uh, quick glance of where you perhaps need most support. Um, it's particularly useful if you're trying to understand where you might want to get additional tuition or how to, um, how to kind of arrange your homework schedule such that you're actually giving the right component of the test the right amount of weighting. Um, the final thing I think I'll cover, I'll, I'll hand over to you for with the web webinars and the other aspects of the portal um, that do allow the classroom aspect and more yeah. human interaction to come in. Yeah, so I'll just stop sharing at this point and we'll just get back to the PPT perhaps. 
Right. So we do have webinars and live classes, right? And these webinars don't deal just with the online, you know, the testing environment and all the just the uh, what do you say? It's it's not just about how to solve a specific question because that we'll be dealing with extensively through all the videos, through all the worksheets, through all the reports that you saw. So reports, of course, can be more detailed as well, right? When it comes down to full mocks. But uh, when we talk about webinars, these webinars are also about important things like mindfulness, about important things like uh, keeping control of yourself or developing that sense of control when it comes to the test, OK? So I'll give you a very simple example. 65 minutes to solve 52 questions on the ACT. Most of my students balk at it at first, right? That means how am I supposed to, if I'm not, especially not into reading novels, that's that's a term that most of my students use, that uh, phrase, turn of phrase, that, you know, I'm not into reading. So how am I going to tackle such a very difficult paper, in fact. How am I going to read through it, etc.? So the webinars give you this holistic view, not just of the test, but also about how mm -hmm. you can manage time, you can manage uh, different elements of the test that don't get covered just by looking at the topics or the concepts, and also about managing yourself during the test, which is, a, I think, a vital, I mean, it's an integral part of the test taking uh, experience. Yes. Indeed. So, um, so online testing in 2020 and beyond, just to wrap up um, everything neatly in, into a summary, um, what we're likely to see is the continued relevance of standardized tests. Don't be fooled by universities going test optional as the SAT and ACT will still form the basis of sifting, as, um, as I said right at the start. This is also, of course, only a temporary measure. Um, while the system adjusts to the current pandemic and um, to the potential for future pandemics as well. The important thing to say about these kinds of tests is, of course, that they have international recognition as well. The US evidently, but also in Europe, in Asia and beyond. Um, clearly for the US, it's still critical to have an ACT or SAT score because you, you, you can't enter universities without one. But the spike for the requirement of a standardized test elsewhere in Europe and Asia um, is, is remarkable. And it's likely that as university entrants and applicants go up, universities are going to be quite likely to switch over to this very easy form of initial sifting. In the post COVID-19 environment, um, of course, online testing is even more likely to last, I, at least as an option, even as human test centers reopen. Utilizing an online platform like this means you are already future proof. You have a realistic and familiar environment that gives you predictability with scoring and helps problem areas to be quickly and easily addressed as our carver set. And beyond the world of university applications, as I touched on um, when talking about the history of these tests, these will come up again and again for you, whether in your further academic studies or during your professional life. So it's well worth familiarizing yourselves with this process. Be it psychometric tests for government or civil service entrance exams, um, you are likely to come across these broad categories of question types and many of the subcategories as well. They all come from a common source, as I said at the start of the presentation. Um, and also for, for your further studies, um, indeed, when you come back to take things like MBAs um, or when you do further legal studies, um, you'll find that the SAT and ACT rear their heads in a slightly different form. So it helps to be prepared by getting familiar with our environment, whatever it is we're doing. The world of bricks and mortar education will of course always be with us as our cover has said, but the future will undoubtedly be one that combines this new digital third element as well. I call it bricks, mortar and motherboards. Um, and finally, it's very important to take a holistic approach to whatever preparation you're doing for something as arduous as the SAT or ACT. And this is something that in closing, it's worth pointing out that we're giving a lot of attention to. Indeed, it's one of the founding, one of the cornerstones of the Collegify platform is to help streamline the hours that you put in to what is already an additional strain on your already busy lives. So with that, um, 
I will turn the floor over to uh, a Q and A, and um, we'll ha be happy to take any questions that you may have. Perfect. Thank you, Arkav, and thank you, Andreas. There's a lot of questions coming in the chat box. Um, I might just ask you a couple of them, which is the first question that I'm going to take up is from Haridas, who asks, which colleges in India take SAT and ACT? Uh, so uh, Haridas, a lot of colleges in India, uh, private universities in India, ask uh, for SAT or ACT in lieu of their own examinations. Yeah. So if you're somebody who's taken an SAT or examination or an ACT examination, you can be waived off by giving their requirements. Um, is there any change that's going to happen in the IELTS test pattern? Either of you want to take that question? No, any change in the what pattern? The so IELTS test. The IELTS, the IELTS test pattern. Test pattern. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not so far as I know, because IELTS has already changed a little bit. So right now, even before the COVID situation in India, you could have gone for either a, a IELTS online or, for that matter, an IELTS paper and you know pencil test. Right. So uh, there has been a little bit of change in the IELTS. That means fewer passages, fewer questions, but no radical change in sight. IELTS is a pretty traditional sort of uh, mindset. Right. So that's why they even now, even during this situation, the speaking test is always with the examiner. And of course, not not uh, in the physical presence of the examiner. But yeah. So IELTS, no, not really. Not perfect. Really. And since our discussion has mostly been routed around the SAT and the ACT, I'm going to go a step ahead and ask for your take on something called the SAT subject tests and also the advanced placements. So what do you think about them and are they important part of the college admission process? Andreas, I think you can address this. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think I'll, I'll just make a broad point about the subject tests and, and the advanced placement tests or APs. I mean, what we're talking about with the standardized test is the baseline or the foundation of your application. Um, this is what gets you through that first sift. Um, everything else is sort of an accoutrement or an, ad an addition to your application that will get you through the further sifting processes, right, or the further sifting stages. Um, an AP or advanced placement exam is designed to supplement the US high school system. Um, but don't get too caught up on the sort of the traditional routes, I guess, um, for how you make yourself have um, as all singing and all dancing a CV as you can. Um, going back to the sort of the apportionment diagram that I had for this, you know, the 60% for your grades, the 20% for the SAT and the 20% for your essays. Um, it's all well and good having some APs and some SAT subject tests in there to supplement or to, to bolster out your application, but not to the detriment of any other of these components, right? So you still have to score well on your A-levels before you go and do your advanced extension award A-levels or your S-levels as they were once called. Um, the name keeps changing every year. Um, it's all very well, um, you know, taking uh, that extra uh, higher level subject to your IB um, but not to the detriment of your kind of your basic IB score and not to the detriment of the community service you're doing or the sports captaincy that you might get. You need to be a rounded package because you're not going to get into the university that you want to on any one strand alone. You really do have to make sure that you achieve to the required standard in every single one of these components and the basic and the most important of which, especially if we're talking about US university entry, is the SAT or the ACT? Without that, it's a uh, what's called a sine qua non. You're you're not you know your uh, your participation in the national football or netball team uh, just won't won't even pass muster because you're just not going to get through that first sifting. Great, thank you for the input, Andreas. A couple of questions that are coming in, and I'd like to address a few of them, which is. Um, Sanya asks, how important is SAT for Indian colleges? Could I give a few names? Also, is not being a science student a disadvantage? So Sanya, what mm -hmm. I suggest is that you please go online and visit the College Board website. College Board mm -hmm. is the organization which conducts the SAT examination. And it has a very comprehensive, exhaustive list of colleges which accept the SAT scores in India. So right. I think that would be the best and the most, most precise resource to refer. I yeah. also think that. Uh, Coming from a particular background, whether science or non-science, 
is definitely not a disadvantage. Uh, the SAT yeah. is, uh, or the ACT for that matter, is a test of your verbal and your quantitative skills. It's a test of aptitude. Uh, and, and as Andreas and, and Arka pointed out during the, during the session that uh, it's not about what set of subjects you're coming from, but how you can actually uh, calibrate your practice, prepare and strategize, that will determine your score. Any of you mm. want, want to append to that? Uh, I think there's worth adding that there's a, it's just a trend in modern education anyway. And I think there's an artificial separation of you know the humanities side and the science side. Both require you to be logical and rigorous and detailed. Um, the same goes for the verbal components as it does for the maths components. And I, I actually tend not to see too much difference in the kind of mind or the kind of brain that, that succeeds in these things, regardless of where your actual interest, your personal interest might lie. You might like reading novels and you might like history, but it comes down to much the same thing. Can you learn a rule and can you apply it under time pressure and consistently every time? Um, if you're able to do that in maths, then you should take strength from that and you should take strength from the fact that you can apply that to your verbal performance in the SAT. At the same time, if you're very good at English, you're very good at spelling, punctuation and grammar, that means you're very capable of applying rules consistently under pressure. Um, so you should take, again, you should take strength from that and realize that actually with a bit of application and practice, you're perfectly capable of passing with flying colors in the maths component of this kind of test as well. Perfect. Uh, Arkav, anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, yeah, I mean, when it comes to the ACT, for example, I'll just take a stray example. So, <clears throat> Ashoka, for example, uh, will accept your ACT score, right? Will look forward to you sending them the ACT score. Now, why is that? Because they want to see applicants who have or who possess a certain degree of, you know, verbal um, competency okay so let's not uh, you know if, if i'm being very direct here not all of us has uh, you know in schools our schooling system doesn't really allow for great writing skills or verbal skills so what happens is an act score is sort of like a you know uh, it's like a certificate that yeah this uh, this person really understands english can apply consistent rules like andreas said and that's about it right so it's it's definitely valuable if your score is good so it's not as if a very low SAT score will get you anywhere in India. So there are other universities as well. And of course, you can look at the list, right? So yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, thank you so much, Andreas and Arkav. It's been great having you here. Uh, as an organization, Mindler is committed to making careers happen for its students. And we definitely feel stronger with uh, Collegeify on board as a partner for SAT and ACT prep. Uh, the awesome platform that you guys just saw in the presentation is now available right from your Mindler dashboards. So as a part of the Mindler Collegeify collaboration, you can always go ahead and take the diagnostic test uh, that Arkav and Andrea spoke about. And then if you feel up to it, you can explore the full platform. Uh, thank you so much again, guys, for, for this amazing session that you, that you just gave us. And thank you so much, everyone here. Uh, for coming on time before time punctuality is a great great skill to have and it is definitely something which is going to take you ahead in life uh, at this point of time uh, thank you so much again for uh, for being here and spending your evening with us all the very very best thank you so much for coming in uh, have a great evening and all the best please take care don't touch your face and wear a mask bye bye sound advice thank you very much for having us uh, and good luck to you all taking your exams this year perfect Thank you.